This is Support is Sexy, episode 397, with Chef Takumbo Koiki, creator of Takumbo's Kitchen. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I bring you inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and lessons to help you take your business to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. You know, it just would not be the same without you. And if you are a woman entrepreneur, a creative, a writer, an author, a consultant, a coach, anyone who is trying to get your voice out there into the world, your voice and your message, I want you to be sure to check out Girl on Podcast Gift dot com. Girl on Podcast is a booking service, especially for women, supporting women on both sides of the mic. And if you want to find out how to use podcast guesting to get your voice out there and how to be an unforgettable guest, go to Girl on Podcast Gift dot com to download my free guide on how to be an unforgettable podcast guest for all the right reasons. Now, you know how excited I am, at least I hope you know how excited I am to speak to you all every day or many times a day, however often that you listen. I appreciate you. It wouldn't be the same without you. The show wouldn't be the same without you, nor would I be the same without you as a podcast host. So it means a lot to have you as listeners. It means even more to be able to feature listeners on the show. Love it, love it, love it. And today I am super excited to bring you one, maybe one of our longest listeners. I'm not sure, but she's been listening, she says, for over a year now. So that's a pretty long time. Takumbo Koiki. And Takumbo is the creator of Takumbo's Kitchen, a fantastic restaurant concept. I would say restaurant, but she calls it a pop-up. She calls it a supper club. You'll hear about the evolution of Takumbo's Kitchen in this episode. A really fun episode, great information. Whether you are someone interested in the restaurant business or not, Takumbo has great advice and tips for you about getting publicity for your small business. A lot of tips also about ways that, as she says, to copy, adapt, and paste when looking at your market and doing your market research. So you'll get all of that in here, but you'll also get Takumbo's incredible story an amazing journey and a story of resilience, which I hope will be inspiring to you. No matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it seems in the moment, one, you know what's always here for you, at least on this end, support. Always know support is out there for you. Also know that you can make it through it. Whatever it is, this too shall pass. Stay focused on your dream and your vision. You will come out on the other side. So I hope you find as much inspiration in this episode as I did during the conversation. So without further ado, Takumbo Koiki. So Takumbo, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to chat with you. Oh my God, Elaine, I am so beyond excited to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. I'm like, this was a year ago that I discovered the show and I literally binged listen <laughs> episodes in like one week so oh this my is goodness amazing thank you so much and I'm glad I had a lot for you to listen to you're the reason yes. that I do so many episodes a week I'll have to remember that and they really helped me there was one particular episode I remember the lady you know she couldn't make her daughter's birthday because she had to travel out of state I remember thinking oh my god so it's not just me right there's always something right and there's exactly. always someone else who's gone. That's a good point. Before we start, it's always someone else who's going through, if not exactly the same, but something similar. And you don't feel so alone, which is what I hope the show would be about. Yes. Awesome. So our first question for you, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Honestly, I am not sure I have truly fallen in love with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think this for me is because entrepreneurship as a label is still very new in my mind, even though I've been involved in business since I was 14. Um, my mom has always been a businesswoman and she, you know, when we lived in Nigeria, she would buy and sell. She would travel to different countries to buy things which she would bring back to Nigeria and sell. Um, she then moved to London in the early 90s and a year later I joined her 
but she came into um, England without, um, she came into England as a refugee and she didn't have her immigration status for a very long time. Whereas I, on the other hand, had British citizenships from birth. Mm-hmm. So when I was 14, she would, she actually sent me to New York um, to meet family for the first time and do some shopping for her. And I would never forget that first trip because um, the second day my auntie woke me up and she gave me um, directions of how to go from Brooklyn to Manhattan. And I was looking at her like, why are you giving me all of these? And she was like, you don't think I'm going to take two weeks off work to be taking you shopping. Oh, my goodness. So at 14, your first time in New York, you were told how to get there by yourself. Exactly. From Brooklyn. I literally from Brooklyn and, you know, would tell me what train to get, how to change to the express train, what platform to go on. And so, yeah, and I had to do that. And, you know, this was before the days of smartphones. So, you know, I'd have to go into um, uptown, go into and even till now, West 31st by Broadway is permanently stuck in my head. Right because that's where I used to do all my shopping. I used to find it hard to buy perfume in England because I'm so used to buying cans of flowers for $40. And I'm like, why am I going to pay hundred pounds to buy that? No. Right. I could go to New York and, but it's so funny because that's such a, even though you weren't a New York kid, but it's such a New York kid thing. You could see kids <laughs> on a train, eight years old. They're by themselves. They're fine. They know how to get yeah. around. It's just a very self-sufficient city for most people oh my god I mean I have to remind my mom of that now because now it's like when I'm trying to get my daughter to go somewhere by herself she's like no she's too young um mom you <laughs> when I was 14 out of the country to New York to do shopping for her and and so for me you know growing up I you know I was involved in my mom's business a lot I would you know and also I started doing my own business so when I went to New York my friends were like and because I was doing those trips like two three times a year um, and you know, they'll give me orders of things that they wanted and I'll buy it and I'll come back and I'll sell it to them, you know, make a little bit of profit. So I'd always been involved in business, but I think I never thought of myself as doing business full time because the way my mom did her business was very much the African way. And that involved selling things on credit and then clawing the money back very slowly weeks and months later Mm. which didn't make sense to me because by the time the money came in you know it never was enough because she just it didn't make her needs and even though she felt she was making a profit I just didn't really like connect with that um so for me I just you know never thought about doing business and very much always thinking about other options and possibilities so even now that I'm now running my own business full-time for the last two years and again, a business that I did not expect to ever get involved in. Um, it's made me kind of reluctant to be like, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. And, you know, this is what I really want to do. Because actually, I tell people, if Oprah offered me a paid job today, oh, sorry, it would be like, bye-bye, Tokumba's kitchen. Right. <laughs> bye-bye. <laughs> you might not be alone in that boat. A lot of us might be able to to make our uh, our deals with Oprah if she were to offer anything. I don't think you're alone there. <laughs> But how do you think those trips to New York, um, if at all, how did they change you as a child, not even uh, just as an entrepreneur, what you thought about entrepreneurship, but even as a young person, do you feel like it made you grow up any faster? Um, I don't think that trip itself necessarily made me grow up faster because I think just my other early life experiences had given me a great sense of resilience. Mm -hmm. Um, I think just being able to travel to a city like New York, which is so dynamic. I literally fell in love with New York my first trip. It's still my favorite city till today. Um, And I think that experience of, you know, negotiating with adults and, you know, bargaining and, you know, being quite grown up you know, helped me to learn a lot of lessons that I was then able to use um, in terms of my own development. So like I said, even now I find it very hard to go into a store and pay full price for an item because I know what the wholesale costs are. Mm -hmm. Um, And it gave me a new worldview. So I saw things differently to my friends who had never left London, never left England um and you know it, it, it kind of broadened my horizon so for me growing up I always knew that I wanted to leave London eventually you know growing up I wanted to move to America and live in America um which I did and then I realized I didn't want to live in America anymore so I left where did you live I lived in Washington DC for okay. a year and yes. then you went back to London and then I came back to London I've been trying I've been telling people I'm 
getting off this island and I've been doing that, running away, coming back, running away, coming back <laughs> um, and eventually thinking, I just need to get my daughter through secondary school, high school, and then I am permanently off. Right. Now, what is um, what is one of the earlier experiences, if you'd like to talk about it, that you mentioned that you feel like was life changing for you? You said in your earlier childhood, there were experiences that really pushed you to grow up. Yes. So basically, um, my dad died when I was just six months old. Mm. And that really that experience, you know, not having a dad and, you know, losing my dad the way that I did um, impacted my childhood for a very long time. Um, so, for example, I remember when I was a teenager, my mom is a devout Muslim and always been my old family a Muslim. Mm -hmm. I rebelled against religion because I just did not believe in God. I always tell my mom, you know, I don't believe in God. You know, why would a God take away my dad from me? And also because my dad was a very wealthy man back in Nigeria. And I saw, you know, the lifestyle that my mom lived and, you know, with his, with him and the other wives and the other children before he passed away and our, her life changed drastically. And then when she came to England, having to, you know, take menial jobs and, you know, work so hard that at the age of 50, she developed arthritis in her knees, mm -hmm. both knees. And, you know, obviously part of the reason why she was sending me to New York was because she needed to do more to take care of my siblings who were still in Nigeria so for me, all of that meant that I felt very hungry for a long time, um, really hungry at God, um, just kind of like, you know, you took my dad away from me. And, you know, when people talked about their dads and, you know, I remember, and also when I met my uncle, that was the first time I had a father figure. Mm hmm. And it was interesting because my cousin, who was a, who was a couple of years younger than me, obviously was going through her teenage moments where she didn't like her dad. And I was always envious because I'm like, your dad is so great. I know he's annoying because he's always cracking the crappiest jokes, but you've got a dad and right. he loves you and he wants so much for you. Um, and so, yeah, for me, that experience and just, you know, knowing what my life could have been and my dad stayed alive and, you know, it made me very resentful, but it also kind of helped me develop a lot of resilience, which then helped me deal with a lot of other things that I had to deal with. And also just, um, so my name Tokumbo actually means somebody or something that came from over the seas in Yoruba, which is a language and a tribe from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So though I was born here in London, um, my mom took me back to Nigeria as a baby where I then spent the next nine years of my life before returning to London. So for me, um, my experience, my early childhood experience, and then moving from Nigeria to a country like England, where, you know, the way, you know, parenting, the way education system, everything is so vastly different. Um, it was a cultural shock. And, you know, I struggled initially to deal with some of the things that were happening for me. Um, another example was when I was younger. So in Nigeria, where to move from primary, what you guys call, I think, middle school, mm -hmm. high school, you actually have to sit an exam. And that would then determine whether you got into um, the next level of your education. And I actually started my primary school when I was eight, and um, my secondary high school when I was just eight years old. Wow. When, because I sat the exam. And even though I think from what my mom says, because I can't even remember the details myself. I think I missed the point by like two marks, but she went to the school and spoke to the head teacher and managed to convince him. And it was a boarding school um, because a lot of Nigerian private education system are boarding. Um, so yeah, I was in boarding school at the age of eight, seven, eight, when my peers would have been like 10, 11. So I was a very intelligent, very gifted young child. But then when I came back to London, because the English system is you're placed in class according to your date of birth. Right. Right. So because even though I had missed the last two years of English primary school and actually already done the first year of English secondary school, I was placed back into year six, which is what my age group were. And I remember the first few months just really struggling to kind of fit in and finding the work so easy because it's like, really, this is what you guys are doing? Like, are you for real? Like, you're making me have to, like, copy my handwriting. How's that going to help me? Right. <laughs> you know? right. Um, and you were and so I, far along at that point. And I was so far along at that point. But then on the flip side, the English education system was very lax in terms of discipline. And I, when I, by the time I got to secondary school, I realized I could talk back to my teachers. 
Whoa. <laughs> and that was it. And that was it. Um, I would imagine were you um, bored in those classes too? I know well, a lot of people who were so advanced in their country and they come to the States or to England and they're so far advanced, but they have to stay in these classes. They end up bored and which exactly. usually causes trouble. And many years later, when I myself then worked in education and they then started a new scheme for gifted and talented children, I was thinking that's what I needed. And I remember one parent's evening, one of my teachers actually telling my mom that, you know, I was one of her best students, but I was also one of her worst students. And like you said, the reason for that was I was so bored. I mean, my our lessons were like one hour and I would go in and within 15, 20 minutes, I would have done the work that was required of us. And then I spent the next 40 minutes just hanging around and playing and messing about with my friends because nothing was challenging me. And literally by the time I spent the five years of secondary school education, I dumped down to the point that when I sat my GCSE um, exams to get into college and university later on at 15, 16, I was so worried because I wasn't even able to get the grades that I would have been able to have gotten very easily a few years before that. If you have remained challenged and stayed on the track that you were on before. Okay. So what did you end up uh, wanting to study when you went? Did you go to university? I did go to university. What did so. you end up studying? What did you think you were going to become at that point? I actually knew I am. So I wrote um, an English so for my English project, I did English language and English literature. And one of the projects that we had to do was writing your autobiography. Mm. Then talks about your future. And I actually discovered this writing um, about five years ago. And it was like, oh my God, I wrote my future when I was 15 because pretty much everything that I wrote, I accomplished. So I wrote that I wanted to be a social worker and, you know, I wanted to move to America. I wanted to have a child. I didn't know whether I wanted to get married or not. I was quite ambivalent. Even though I was very pragmatic at the age of 15. I see. Um, in terms of what I wrote, um, it was just so scary. Like when I came across that writing as an adult. And so for me, I'd always wanted to be a social worker, but when I finished um, college at the age of 18, which was my A-levels, which would then determine what um, university I went to. And the interesting thing for me, actually, so when I was in um, secondary school and I was still feeling I was quite smart, I actually wanted to be a doctor. But then I remember going to the careers advisor and I was like, okay, I wanna be a doctor. I want to study medicine. And she was like, but the subject choices that I had chosen for my GCSEs meant that I couldn't take the medicine pathway. So I was like, okay, well, what else can I do? So I had to do, I think, one of those um, psychometric tests, which kind of tells you what you could do. Mm. And I thought, okay, I want to do, I want to be a psychiatrist. And then she's like, no, you need to study medicine to become a psychiatrist, but you can't do medicine. And then as a young child, I kind of thought, okay, what goes with psychiatrists? And in my head, I rhymed psychology. With and I was sociology. Like, yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so literally for my A-levels, I remember choosing psychology and sociology. And then at the time you could only do, you had three options and I couldn't think of a third option. And then I just thought, okay, you know what? I love talking, you know, so I did communication studies. So those were my three A-levels and I absolutely loved psychology. I really, you know, from the first lecture that I had, I loved everything about it. So I studied psychology at university because even though I wanted to be a social worker, at the time in England, you had to be, um, social work was a diploma and you had to be 21 to be able to sit um, the diploma. And obviously at 18, I wasn't 21 and I couldn't be a social worker. So I went and did psychology um, instead, thinking I was going to become an education psychologist. Um, so I finished my psychology degree and then I started working in education. And then I realized that the education system in the UK was not the place where I wanted to be <laughs> because <laughs> The children, the kind of child that I was when I was growing up, with the children that I was now having to deal with and try to educate, and Elaine, the African in me, could not deal with it. <laughs> it came back to haunt you, right? Oh my God. I was like, I can't beat these children. No, 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 no. I was like, <laughs> okay. not for me. So I, um, so I got out of education. And then at the time when I decided I no longer wanted to um, become a teacher, um, and actually become an education psychologist because when I looked at the pathway to become an education psychologist, so basically you had to be a trained teacher for two years, then you had to see some more, um, you had to do like a further um, master's 
And at the end of it, when I looked at what education psychologists were getting paid, it was like, that's what I would have, that I would be getting as a social worker. Mm-hmm. And then the government had changed the education system for social work. So it was now a degree and a master's. And because there was such a shortage of social workers, they were basically offering you the master's for free, as well as giving you a bursary grant. So I said, okay, well, this is something I'd always wanted to do from when I was young. So yeah, 10 years ago, this time, 10 years ago, I was starting my master's to become a social worker. And was there a moment in that where everything changed and you decided, I'm going to open a food business? Where does, the, where does, <laughs> the, food, where does the food come in? Many, many years later. So, I mean, this is, the, this is why sometimes I feel like I'm an accidental entrepreneur because 10 years ago, I, if you had said to me I would be starting a food business, I would have just laughed at you. Like, really? I don't mm-hmm. even like it. It was nowhere in your, in your idea. Nowhere. Consciousness. It was not something that I considered. It was not something that I, put, I, you know, at the time I didn't like cooking. You know, it's only in the last couple of years that my attitude to food changed. And mm. it was actually living in DC that impacted and changed. And that was the light bulb moment for me because um, I remember moving to DC in January 2013, just before the second um, Obama inauguration. And I met this amazing, beautiful, tall, stunning, British American lady at a networking event about two weeks after I'd arrived and she came I remember she came over to me and introduced herself and she was like oh I'm Nigerian like you I was like oh yeah sister what's up (laughs) got on and you know she invited me to come and watch the Super Bowl with her and her flatmates and it was amazing and then it was also around the same time the African Cup of Nations was um happening and my friend is a foodie like if you mention food she gets excited Mm mm-hmm so she was like, oh, we should go to this um, Ghanaian restaurant in D.C. where we can watch the game. And I remember that was just basically the beginning of all our, all the adventures that I had in D.C. were all food related. Mm-hmm. You know, so when it was going to Chinese after having, you know, going clubbing or going to get high up at 4 a.m. in the morning after having an, going to an all nice party. So food became kind of like a focal point for me because it was the way that I connected to people. I made new friends, um, would go for brunch. And also when I was feeling homesick, I would, you know, invite my friends over and I would cook for them. And then, you know, they'll be like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is so good. Um, But the particular moment when my attitude to food really changed and cooking was I remember a friend of mine, he dropped over um, to visit me unexpectedly and he was quite hungry. And I said, well, I don't really have any food. I think I've got some plantain and, you know, I'll fry some eggs. So I did that. And I remember I'd already eaten my dinner. So I just sat there watching him and he devoured the meal. Like I just served him this amazing three-star Michelin plate (laughs) of food. And that literally kind of sparked a moment of thinking, oh, my God, wow, my food can make somebody this happy. And it was Uh, food that you just had been making your whole life or whenever you started cooking when you were younger like you said it wasn't food wasn't a part of your life in that way then it's not like you grew up in a restaurant kind of business no and I remember learning to cook at the age of 12 and the reason that stuck to me is because I remember my mom basically forcing me into the Mm -hmm. kitchen Mm -hmm. she started cooking for her family when she was eight so I was already four years behind her so for me cooking was a chore it was something that I had I learned to cook with the expectation that one day I would grow up and have a family of my own and then I would have to cook for them. And even when I got married, I remember one of the last biggest fight that we had before we separated, again, revolved around food. So for me, what was the fight over around food? You didn't want to cook? Something like, not even just that, Elaine. Oh my god, it was so ridiculous. So um, you don't have I mean, to give us all the details, but oh, <laughs> not to get all in your business. Um, so basically, we the relationship that we had was in some ways quite traditional in the sense that I did the cooking, and you know, even though I was working as well and, and studying for my masters, um, and he was expected to you know take care of the household. Um, and I remember one day, um, you know, my daughter was in nursery and I was in my placement. Um, at the time, so for the social work um, masters, I also had to do work placement, and the placement that I was doing was really emotionally challenging because I was working with um, homeless and substance misuse um, people in the centre of um, London, 
So I remember I'd already got the lamb chops. It was actually a fight over lamb chops. <laughs> and I seasoned it the night before because I love to season my night and meat overnight. And, you know, season the marinating and left in the fridge. And I wanted to make lamb chops and mashed potatoes for dinner. And so on my way home from my placement. And so the reality of my life at the time was East work, East started work early in the morning, but it would be done by like mid afternoon. I would start my placement at nine, um, 9.30. So I would have to take our daughter to nursery. I finished at five o'clock. Guess who still had to go pick the daughter up from nursery? You did. Even though he had already finished work and was home the last how many hours. So um, on my way home at, at the train station, I remember texting him or calling him. Oh, you know, I've already seasoned the lamb chops. Can you just put it in the grill? I'm going to be home. You know, I'm going to pick up our daughter from Finn, get into my car and I'll be home in about 15 minutes. Then I'll come home and do the rest of the dinner. And you know, that was the conversation that I had. So I think yeah, it was a text. And Elaine, I remember coming home thinking, oh, I'm going to smell the lamb chops. I was so hungry and tired. And I was thinking, yeah, you know, all I have to do is put the potatoes on and, you know, dinner will be ready quickly. And I remember getting home and he was laying in bed Uh-oh. and was in the grill. And I just thought, you are such a selfish, selfish man. And that was it for me. So, yeah, that was one of the last fights that we had. And then you separated. And your daughter was how old at that time? It was about 18 months at the time when we separated. So, um, yeah, the, the marriage was another crazy part of my life. And, you know, so my master's was um, a two year program, which I started in September 2010. Um, my daughter was born in February 2010. So she was actually seven months when I started my master's, which was, again, in itself, just a crazy, crazy experience. Mm hmm. Um, at the time when I started my master's. So before, when we got pregnant, when I got pregnant, we moved in together very shortly after. And that was when I realized that he actually was not ready and not serious about the kind of committed relationship that we went then in at that point. And, you know, I was basically almost kicking him out almost every weekend. Um, but, you know, family would get involved and, you know, Africans being Africans, they'll be like, oh, you know, give him Try another to make chance. it work make it work you're having a baby together you're getting married all of that all of that so but I was gonna say I think his his lamb I don't know him obviously for everyone listening I don't know this person but the lamb chop move not putting it on the grill sounds like a passive aggressive move oh he was one of those things like this is gonna make her angry so I'm not gonna do it and because Tox was the loud Tox was the loud one in the relationship every when it all went to the way it did everybody blamed me everybody thought I was the problem. Mm. It was only many years later on when things started coming into light that people were like, oh, oh, so even though he was quiet, he was this devious and manipulative. I was like, even my mom, I was like, yeah, I've been trying to tell you people, but you weren't listening. So yeah, it was. um, So now I can definitely see why cooking felt like a chore for you. It was something that you did for the family things that you have to do, not thinking about it as something for pleasure or something that brings people such pleasure until you're sitting across from your friend and you see him devour the plate. Exactly. So, yeah. So what point then, once you see that, you say the light bulb moment goes off, then how do you get from there to, I'm going to start Tecumbo's Kitchen and create this fantastic business that has now been featured on the BBC several times and people are talking (laughs) about it everywhere. And, and as you said, you sort of an accidental entrepreneur. So how did you, how did you get to that point? It was actually like a four year journey because um, when I left DC at the end of 2013, um, I then came back to London. And because at the time, you know, I'd spent a couple of years not really working or, you know, being on on the employed. Um, and also I'd moved to Nigeria for a couple of years. Um, so I came back to London and it was like, I need to get a job. You know, I'm living back at home with my mom. Um, I've got a young daughter to think about. I need to sort myself out. So I applied for um, work within social care and social services once again. And I started that job in January 2014. And very early on, I remember just feeling very, very demoralized within the role that I was in um, to the point where every morning to get up to go to work was a struggle. And then I was also having issues with my colleagues and everything just felt really, I was, you know, very emotionally unhappy and depressed. And during that time, I just um, 
I became a very close friend with this amazing dynamic um, Nigerian personality um, lady who used to work in media and, you know, would go around to hers and I would always be complaining about, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm tired of this job. And she was always like, oh, you, there's so much to you talking about, you know, you, you could do all of these things. You know, you're like an onion. There's so many layers to you that you've not even peeled. And in August 2015, I just got to the point where I thought, I'm no longer happy with this job. And even though I don't know what I'm going to do next, I'm just going to resign. And I did. Um, so I resigned from work. Um, and then I spent the next year just really trying to figure it out. Um, and at that point, um, I mean, I love fashion. Not in the sense that I go to the fashion week or I buy Vogue magazine, but I love to look good. I like to see other people look good. You know, if I see something that looked good on somebody, I would compliment them. Um, and even the job, the last job that I was in, it was so interesting because I was going through my old Instagram pictures the other day. And there was something that I remember one of the workplace that I was in, um, I was only there on a Friday. And because I love colorful things, you know, very bright colors, yellow is my favorite color. That's what I would wear. And the manager in the office, whenever she saw me, she would always be like, oh my God, you look so good. I love this piece of jewelry that you're wearing. And I remember one day she came in and when I came in, she was so excited to show me this piece of jewelry that she had bought for herself, which she said to me, she would not have bought it before, but because she'd seen me wearing such vibrant colors, it inspired her mm -hmm. to start like that. So I was like, oh really? Like <laughs> I got influence like that? Influence was like, I didn't even know. I mean, this was before influencer was a thing. I was right. like, um, so for me, I am, um, I love shopping, you know, shopping. I, before I started the business, when I still had money and I was getting paid, I was a bona fide shopper. I started shopping when I was 14, Elaine. So, you know, right, my that's life. right. Traveling to shop. Yeah. So for, and then, you know, and also I'd always been involved in like, you know, when I lived in Nigeria, I would buy clothes and I would sell. So I was always involved in some aspects of shopping. And also I'd had friends who didn't like shopping, which I did not understand, and then, and because I'm such a bagging hunter and I always found the great baggings, they would always be like, oh, talk to you just do the shopping for me. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll be a, pers a personal shopper. So I started exploring that possibility. Um, and then, you know, that didn't quite pan out. And during this whole time, um, because of the relationship I was developing with my mentor, um, this lady who then became like a mentor to me, um, who was also having some, um, she was feeling, she was having some um, illness which meant that she, there was certain food that she couldn't eat. Um, I was always going around there and I was always cooking for her and then, you know, trying to find, you know, new recipes and ways to help her manage the um, issues that she was having. And during this time, people would always be like, oh my God, Tox, you're so good. You should be a caterer. You should start your own food business. Um, and I remember meeting a mutual um, friend of ours. And she was like, look, I don't do friendship for friendship's sake. It's either we're friends because we're working together or we're sleeping together. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm not going to sleep with you. Right. So let's try and work together because I actually really want to be friends with you. So I remember we met up and we were like, okay, you, work, you come from a tech background. I come from social work. We have absolutely nothing in common except I like to cook. You like to eat. Is this your mentor or this is someone you met through your mentor? Hmm? This was my mentor's friend. Your mentor's friend. Okay, got it. So so we came up with an idea of um, doing a street food business, which was something I'd, again, thought about when I was in D.C. because of all the amazing food truck culture that I saw in D.C. Mm -hmm. and the fact that I felt African food was never represented um, in all the other continents that you could see. Um, so for me, I was like, yes, yeah, street food. So, you know, we started working together on the idea, but then I put that to the back burner. And then in the summer of 2015, I went to a street food festival, which is also a music festival because I wanted to see this amazing Nigerian musician, who, um, Femi Kuti. Yes. Um, perform. And Elaine, can you believe I missed his performance because I was queuing up for two hours waiting for jerk chicken to be ready. Is that when you knew that you were serious about this food thing? I if you miss a Femi Kuti performance. And I googled how to start a street food business and that was it and I just it just everything just kicked off um five weeks later I was trading I started my own street food um stall at a um, festival called Africa Utopia which takes place at a very prominent um place in London called the South Bank Centre which is you know right in the middle of town 
And, you know, I was serving the kind of street food that I grew up eating in Nigeria. And it was an amazing experience. You know, I learned a lot of lessons, you know, did a lot of things wrong. But I had so much fun and it was great for me. And that just kind of kicked everything off. And even at this point. Sorry, go ahead. Um, even at the time, I didn't realize, you know, because like I said, I didn't have a business plan. You know, it wasn't something that I'd been seriously considering. It was just something an idea that had been planted in my head and then it was watered and then I thought about it and then I put it away. And then eventually I just took action. And from taking that action, everything else just kind of led to something else. It was like a domino effect. Now, for people listening who have food businesses or who are thinking about food businesses who might have had light bulb moments sitting across from people who ate their food and loved it and they're just thinking about it. What would you say was the um, either the first step or the most important step of being a part of that uh, street festival that was very pivotal for you? Asking questions. So I remember when I contacted the organizer and I was like, look, I'm thinking I've just registered my food business. I'm thinking about starting um, doing trading in your event. What do I need to send? And she sent me the paperwork and she was like, oh, you need to have this. You need to have this certificate. I was like, okay, I don't even have any idea what this is. And she said, okay, do you want me to call you and talk you through it? I was like, yes, please. Mm. And I did that. And also I did a lot of market research. So I would actually go to festivals and I would ask people who were trading their questions. I'm like, okay, where did you get your equipment from? They'll be like, I don't know. The manager did. Okay, how can I get hold of your manager? I was asking questions. I was doing macro research. I was taking pictures. I was thinking, oh, that's a really good idea. I like the way they've set up their store. I like this equipment that they're using. I like this. And, you know, I learned from my macro research, but mainly asking questions and asking questions from my competitors. So people who I knew were going to be in direct competition with me, I went and saw what they were doing and how they were doing it so that I could do it better. Right. And that's a, that's such a good point to come up because a lot of us think, of course, you don't want to be, quote unquote, comparing. But there is something to be said about seeing what people in your market are doing. So you can be I always say inspired. You're going to do it your way. You're different than they are. But you need to be inspired by the people who are already doing what you want to do. There's like, I have, oh. Tony Robbins says success <laughs> leaves clues. So look at what other people are doing. And is there something you can take that you think is inspiring and then make it your own? Exactly. And I very much believe in the ad that says, why reinvent the wheel? Right. Like if something's already do, been done, all you need to do is copy, adapt and paste to your situation. I right. don't believe in copy and direct paste. You need to adapt it and right. you need to make your own. But if somebody is doing a street food and they're using an equipment and you go around and almost every other person in that place is using that equipment, why are you going to try and go buy a completely different equipment to use? Right. Start there at least. And like you said, adapt and then see what uh, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, you know, when I started, there was a lot of things I did that eventually I put away because that didn't work for me. It didn't work for my business or my business evolved and I no longer had need for that particular thing or I had to do things in a different way. But I started with what everybody else had and I then, you know, used it to kind of impact how I wanted my business to become. And, you know, and, you know, the business has grown organically. It was only after the first six months that I sat down and then worked on a business plan and started really naturally. It was after the first year of trading because I remember I was doing my um, tax records. And I remember thinking, wow, this is the kind of money the business made without me putting that much effort into this business. What would actually happen if I sat down and seriously thought about this business and put some serious effort into it? Mm -hmm. And in doing so, you know, things started to grow for me in ways that I just could not imagine. And you were doing it full time at that point, right? Or did you still have your social work job? Did you finally leave that? Oh, no, you had resigned from that position. I had resigned from that position, but I was still doing social work part time mm -hmm. to have some kind of income coming in. Right. So for the first six months of, so I started trading um, as a food business in September 2015. And for the first six months, I was also doing part-time social work. And I remember the last social, and I was working in young people's homes with young people who were in care. And I remember one last um, um, shift I did where one of the young person was just being really, really difficult. And I thought to myself, Tukumbo, you have a master's, you're a social worker, you really should not be doing this anymore. And it's either you go back to social work full time or you give this food business a go. And I thought to myself, if I didn't give, if I didn't go full time into the food business and give it a real go, 
I would just give it up and I would go back to social work and then I would be miserable again and then find myself in a situation where I have to resign from work. So I decided to give the um, food business a go. And so, yeah, I started working on the business full time in April 2016. And going and trading is the uh, where you go to the food festivals, right? Yes. The different street. OK, so did you go to different events or was it the same one uh, that you went to? Was it, did you find out different ones around the city and then go and make sure Tacumbo's Kitchen had a uh, booth there or how did you do it? So what had actually happened was after I did the first major festival um, in September, I then started doing a smaller market, which is a weekly um, indoor market. Um, in a part of London that I felt was quite popular, you know, very touristy. Um, but it was the it was shortly before Christmas and that did not work. I mean, I was not making any money at all whatsoever because nobody was coming. And, and so at the end of, and because it's such, you know, the food business is not just the cooking, you know, I was doing the logistic, I'm um, doing the shopping, the marketing. After just four months of doing that business and doing part time work, I was completely exhausted. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of um, the year 2015, I started looking at other options. And, and then I started discovering something called pop ups, which is like a pop up restaurant or somebody just puts together a pop up food event. So and um, I came across a blog who's now, which is written by somebody who's now become a very close friend and one of my biggest support net, um, person called West Africa Cooks. And he had written a blog post, which um, he entitled 21 things you need to know about running a supper club. Um, and a supper club is like a pop-up restaurant. So, you know, a chef would usually design a three course, four course menu, and they would then advertise um, tickets online and people would buy tickets and come um, eat. So like a show we have here in the UK called Come Down With Me, I don't know if you have something similar in the US. Mm, I don't uh, know. That sounds amazing. But the blog, just to make sure I get it, West Africa Cooks. Yes. Okay, I'll make sure I link to that. So Come yeah. Dine With Me is a supper club space. So Come Dine Meet Me is a TV show where basically uh -huh. it's a competition where they will get five complete individuals who would then have to cook for each other. And then at the end of the night, they would score them um, who's the best cook and then whoever cooks the, um, gets the highest score would win 1,000 pounds at the end of the week. Mm. So, so for me, sorry. Go ahead. I'm so excited when I, to hear. Club, that was like the concept. So supper club is like, you know, like I said, you know, it's, it's a similar concept to come down with me because what you're basically doing is you're inviting people to come and eat at your table. And so I read this article and I was like, I can do that. I can do that. I can definitely do all of this. So I reached out to him and I contacted him and I said to him, you know, I'd love to meet up with you. I'm thinking about doing my own supper club and I'd really love to kind of pick your brain. And I remember meeting up with him and, you know, we had this um, amazing conversation, which was like three hours. And then I went home and by that evening, he'd sent me a marketing plan of all the things that I needed to do to start my own supper club. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is amazing. This guy has basically done my job for me. Um, so, yeah, we started working together. And at the beginning of the year in 2015, I decided I was going to do four supper clubs over the year, one each quarter. By the end of 2015, I'd actually done six supper clubs. Wow. So where do you invite? Do you get uh, do you go to different locations, different restaurants or do you invite them into your home? For so I I would rent a space, which is usually a cafe or a restaurant mm -hmm. when they were closed. So most cafes here in London would close, um, especially in central London, they would only be open during the week and then they would close at the weekend. So what they start mm -hmm. doing is they will start renting it out to chefs like myself or people who want to have their own private events. Um, so I would rent the space and then I would put together the menu, put together a team, um, get a team of people. And yeah, I was just basically invite. So the first supper club series that I did were called Food is Ready, Oh Yeah, Come Chop. Because in Nigeria, you know, food was a sharing. Food is something that we share. So when you finish eating, you know, when food is ready, we'll say, ah, food is ready. Oh, yeah, come chop. And oh, yeah, come chop is a slide to say it's time for us to eat. Come and eat with me. So that's what I was doing. I was basically saying to everybody, my food is ready. Please come and eat with me. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it like after that first event? It was amazing because 
I love to talk. And for me, as much as I love the street food, street food felt impersonal because people would come to my store, they'll buy the food and then they'll go. Whereas with a supper club, I could tell them about my culture. I could, you know, it, was a, it wasn't just about the food. It was a cultural immersion. So, for example, I got tablecloths from Nigeria. Um, I would explain to them, you know, the food that I would come out of the kitchen and talk to them about the menu and the food that they're eating. Why I chose that particular menu, um, how the food is traditionally eaten in Nigeria. And also encourage people to actually go home and try out some of those recipes for themselves. So for me, I loved being, I love being center of attention. So doing this <laughs> is basically my opportunity to be like, hey, everybody, look at me, listen to what I'm saying, eat my food, have an amazing time. And also what I found was people were then having this kind of informal networking and making mm -hmm. amazing connections because they'll be like, oh my God, I sat with Elaine and she's doing this and she's doing that. And I'll be thinking, but I was in the kitchen, so I didn't get to it. Right. But Obviously. you were the connector. You brought them all together. So you're being of service too. you're center of attention, but also being of service because you're bringing exactly. all these people together. So how many people did you usually or do you usually have at your supper club dinners? The average is usually about 30 people. Wow. So it's you and how many people do you bring in to work with you on your team? So I usually have about three or four people, but it's usually mostly me in terms of who does the cooking mm -hmm. and who does the, um, so actually last year I tried to um, get into partnership with a guy who's actually also called Tokumbo because Tokumbo in Nigeria is a unisex name. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my God. So when we initially met and he, you know, he was in, into events and he was also a chef, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. We can be like T squared. So in Nigeria, <laughs> there's a group called P squared. Oh. They're brothers and they're Peter and Paul. So they call themselves P squared. So I thought, and at the time I was thinking, this is going to be such great branding. We can rebrand the business and we can call it T squared. And, you know, he's, you know, we had similar looks and we're like, you know, we can be both chic. I had this vision for had us. A vision. And what happened? Oh, my God. Yeah, we, we work well together, but we're both Scorpions. Mm. So when we fought, it was really bad. Mm -hmm. It was like we, we went through divorce several times. Like, actually, the breakup from him was actually worse than my actual breakup from my ex-husband. No. So you <laughs> did work together for some time. We worked together. So in last year, I rebranded my um, supper club as Conversations in Tokumba's Kitchen because like I said to you, I realized people were doing all this informal networking. And even though I was being a center of attention in some ways, I was spending a lot of time in the kitchen. So I decided I wanted to rebrand the supper club and call it Conversations in Tokumba's Kitchen because I wanted to have conversations where I was involved in that conversation. So the vision that I had for the new supper club that each one would have a different theme and also, I would invite different guest speakers to come along and talk to um, the um, participant, the um, people who were coming to the event about the theme that we put together. So the first one that I had was in March for International Women's Day. And the theme that I went for was the International Women's Day theme, which was Bold for Change. So we worked together on that. And that was perfect because he's not... You know, he doesn't like to be center of attention. He prefers to be in the kitchen, you know, doing the work, you know, coordinating the staff. So that's what we did. So I left him to be in the kitchen. We did the cooking together. But then when we came to the hosting, that was my job. And, you know, it was fantastic. And so that first, you know, working together was quite good. We had another event where we did together. But then something came along and then, yeah, it just all went downhill. So we decided, OK, we can't work together. We can still be friends. And then months later, when the business started to grow really big and I needed help, he kind of came back and was like, why don't you why don't you get me to work with you again? And again, we tried to work together and things went particularly bad to the point that we're no longer speaking. So oh, I'm sorry that happened. But at least you, you gave it a try. I and did. You, and yes. I learned never to work with men again. <laughs> never to work to all men. <laughs> That's funny. It's the finding the right part, the right person for you. But I love that you evolve the business where you do get to obviously cook for everyone, but you also get to be a part of that conversation. And it sounds like that helped it grow even more. It did. And so now, so at the time when I started the business, so part of my story as well was, um, like I said, when I moved back to um, London from DC, I was staying at my mom's. 
And I wasn't, you know, my finances wasn't in the position where I could go rent my own place. And actually, the time when I decided I was going to start my business, I had been saving up the deposit to be able to go rent a private accommodation for myself and my daughter um, with the hopes that I would then get some um, help from the government um, because um, I'm on benefits here in the UK, some, what you call the welfare system mm-hmm. in the US. Um, but a lot of the landlords did not like to rent to people who were getting housing benefits. Um, so when I was looking for places, they would always be like, well, you're not working, so we can't rent to you. And so I had all this money. And then I remember having a conversation with my friend saying, okay, I've got this money, but I've also got this business idea. What do you think I should do? Cause I'm getting tired of staying at home with my mom. You know, it's very stifling. I don't have my own space and I'm just really sick and tired of it. By the same time, I know that the struggle to get a place is really hard. And he said to me, just start the business, you know, put that, invest that money in the business. And then once you've grown the business, you will eventually get your own place. So when I actually started the business, I'd actually gone back to the local authority here in the UK and was put into emergency accommodation. Hey, so what's, my, what's emergency accommodation? So when you apply, when you're homeless, which is what I was at the time, because even though I was living with my mom, I was temp- technically homeless. Um, I approached the um, local authority and the law says that if you're a mom or you're a parent mm-hmm. with a child, the lowest and you've got um, rights to stay in the UAM, the UK, and you've got um, connection to that lo- um, local authority that you've gone to. So for example, if I went to, if I grew up in Brooklyn and I went to the Br- um, local authority in Brooklyn, Brooklyn would have to house me mm-hmm. in Brooklyn. So I contacted them and, you know, applied an omelette, which I've done previously several times in my life because of my mom's situation and then other things that happened. Um, when I was growing up. So this was actually the third time I was applying for this um, homeless situation. And the problem that I had was because they can place you anywhere in London. So I was really worried um, because I didn't want, you know, to displace my daughter in terms of, you know, having to move schools. But at the same time, I needed an assistant. So I felt like that was the only way I was going to be able to get out of my mom's, grow my business and get my self back on track so they actually placed me in emergency accommodation which is a better a hostel mm-hmm. and what the law says is because um, i was a parent we could only be placed in the hostel for six weeks so we stayed in the hostel for six weeks so when i actually did the first festival we were living in the hostel and i was going back to my mom's to do the cooking and get everything ready but then i'll come back to the hostel and spend the weekend there and then after the six weeks, they then moved us to a bed seat. And we were in this bed seat up on t- for a year from November 2015 up until August 2016. So and is a bed seat like a shelter or what's a, a bed seat? seat? It's a, so it's a temporary, it's what we, they call it temporary accommodation because okay. that's where they place you whilst they try to find you what is, what would have been um, council um, housing. So it's like your own flat, but it's temporary. Well, yeah, it's a private flat, but it's a temporary flat because you are not, you don't get um, tenancy for the long term. Okay, you're in transition. You're in transition, exactly. Okay. okay. But the problem with the system, because there's such a shortage of housing in London and it's such a big problem. So you actually have families who are left in temporary accommodation for like 13 years. Ooh. <laughs> yes, it's bad. But because um, because of my background in terms of being a social worker and having previously experienced being in temporary accommodation and also just knowing what I needed to do, I was able to um, you know contact the lo- um, w- um, contact the um, authority regularly to the point where they they moved us to a permanent flat, two bedroom flat in August um, last year. So which was great for me because now I have this big kitchen. And I have all this space. I was like, yes, I'm going to start my conversation in Tokumba's Kitchen again in Tokumba's Kitchen. Right. So how has it been then since you've been? Now, this is a permanent accommodation. This is a permanent accommodation now. So this is home. This is where we're going to be for the long haul. Oh, that's great. I'm so happy to hear that you found a place that you can feel safe and comfortable and have your own space. And then, of course, keep your business going. Oh my God. Like I have become, I, I was used to be, I didn't used to be the kind of person that would spend all weekend at home, but now that I have this amazing space, that's all I want to do. 
like the struggle to go out is real. I'm just like, I love my bed. I love my flat. Why do I have to leave? Why do I have to go out? That's a, I'm like that all the time too, girl. But um, I'm trying to be more social. But um, I'm curious, during that time, though, did you, when all the moving and transition, I can imagine it was difficult and having your daughter and moving around, did you still keep the business going in some ways during that time? Oh, yes. I mean, the whole time we were living in the bed seat, I was working on the business full time. So, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, I remember, and the kitchen that we had was so small, um, even for, you know, because the bed seat is basically for a single person, not a single person with a child. Um, you know, having to share bed with my daughter, um, having to cook for 300 people in that kitchen. Oh, Elaine, it was, <laughs> I mean, I'm right. Did you say? 300, yes. What, when were you cooking for 300? So um, about a year into the business. So when I did my first supper club event, I actually did it at a community center, mm-hmm. which is um, linked to a church in my local area. And then, then that was in April. And then in July, I remember they contacted me and it was a Wednesday because they contacted me on the Wednesday morning and they were like, um, so we're doing an event on Saturday and the caterers that we were going to use might possibly not be able to do it. And the only other person that we could think of was you. And we just wanted to know if you'd be able to cook. And I was like, okay, what kind of party, what kind of you know, thing are you doing? And it's like, oh, it's a community party. I was like, okay, cool. How many people are you expecting? And they were like, about 250, 300 people. Wow. I was like, uh what and they were like but you know you can cook whatever you want i'm like okay so what kind of food was your caterer gonna cook and they were like well you can do whatever you want to do so i was like you know i'm just gonna keep it simple i'm just gonna do jello fries chicken and plantain and they were like you know that's fine that's absolutely fine so and at that point elaine prior to that um event the most i had ever cooked for was maybe 30 40 people right i remember that's why i said did you say 300 because i remember you were saying 30 or so people and now it's 300 yeah um and so i literally and again it went back to the asking questions so Mm -hmm. what i did was i contacted friends of mine who i knew were caterers who i'd actually connected with on social media and i asked them questions i was like okay how many bags of rice do i need to cook to make jello fries for 300 people (laughs) How many um, box of chickens do I need to buy? How many box of peppers? And I was asking all these questions and I pulled it off. And that was amazing. Like till today, I just think to myself, wow. Like in with two days notice, I mean, they paid me on Thursday. I got all the things that I needed to get. And Saturday, cooked the food and everybody had a great time. And it was just so amazing. Wow. So imagine if you had even more time to plan it. That's amazing. Right. So, so now tell us what the business looks like now. Are you still um, focused on the supper clubs or do you have vision of it becoming of Tacumbo's Kitchen becoming a full restaurant or what is your your vision at this point? So I am now initially when I started, like I said, because I'm an accidental entrepreneur, accidental food entrepreneur, mm-hmm. um, whenever people had um, asked me what I did and I was like, Tacumbo's Kitchen, I was like, oh, are you going to open your own restaurant? And I'll be like, um, no. Why would I want to open a restaurant? Do you not know that restaurants are the fastest closing businesses? Um, I do not want to go through that life. No, no, no. So initially I was very reluctant to even contemplate that. Um, So I kind of didn't have a vision. All I knew was I wanted to introduce Nigerian food. So, you know, my tagline is bringing you a taste of Nigeria. And I also knew that because I knew that I didn't want to be restrained to staying in London for the rest of my life. I wanted it to be a global thing, which is why when I was choosing my domain name, I was very um, particular about it being .com because I wanted it to be something that if I moved to New York next year, I could take Token Bus Kitchen with me and recreate that experience there. But then last year, I started doing something called residency, which is like an in-house chef. So what I did was, because I, again, seeing what my competitors were doing, because I was like, oh, this person who used to do street food, they're now doing pop-ups. Wait, they're now doing residency. What's a residency? Oh, so they get to be in that kitchen four days a week for six months. Ah, I want to do that because then I get a regular income because the street food are so unpredictable. Um, street food markets and the supper clubs were so unpredictable because even though I really enjoyed the supper clubs, they weren't that very profitable. Mm-hmm. And in the street food, you can cook for 300 people and maybe only 50, 50, and 50 people turn up to that event. So, you know, it was just very difficult and it wasn't regular income for me. And I felt like I was just struggling. I mean, I was doing all this work and I was still broke and I wasn't Mm -hmm. making, I was working and I was making money, but I was broke. 
So, you know, I sat down and I strategized at the end of um, 2016 and I thought, okay, I want to do residency. So I contacted a number of venues and then the first one that I um, got to do, um, they invited me to come along for six weeks. And basically what I had to do was put together a restaurant style menu where I was then providing the lunch and dinner service um, Thursdays to Sunday. And now previous to that, and I actually just wrote an article about, you know, feeling like I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was a chef, even though I was doing the cook and um, food business. And even up to now, there's sometimes I'm thinking to myself, no, nah, I'm not really a chef. You know, I'm just somebody like, you know, that's just really good at cooking. Where did you uh, write that article? Can we see that somewhere? I, did, I can link to I, it. Yes, I will share it with you. So I just okay. posted it on Medium this morning. because oh, okay, one great. Other, one of my other goals is to write a book. And I've started working with a mentor and, you know, she's been saying to, you know, so she just said, you know, get writing. So that was one of the first tasks that I had to do last year was to write a piece which I then shared with her, which I then like, okay, you know what, I'm just going to share it with the world and just kind of take it from there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I did the residency and that was the first. And for me, it was a great learning experience because I really then understood what it meant to be a chef running a restaurant because running a supper club is a completely different entity because a supper club, I get 30 people who are all coming at seven o'clock. They're all eating from the same menu. I already know what food people have ordered and it's already prepped and ready to be served when they arrive. Whereas a restaurant, you put together a menu and then people come and other different things. So you have to kind of, and then you don't know how many people are going to come. You don't know how many food to offer. So it was a very quick learning experience and I really enjoyed that. So over this um, last year, I actually ended up doing three residencies over the year. And, and these are all in different restaurants. These around. are all in different restaurants, different mm -hmm. venues. Some were no, some were um, rest, um, like, so where I'm currently um, doing a residency where um, is an hotel mm -hmm. um, in the north side of London. And I did that uh, last year. Um, one of the places I did was a really small wine bar um, with the smallest kitchen you would ever come across. Mm -hmm. It was ridiculous. I mean, I, I thought my kitchen in the best, it was small, but that kitchen was so small. And again, you know, having to improvise in terms of the equipment that I could use, um, and how to keep the food hot. Um, and then I remember doing a residency at a pub in the East, um, part of London, which is a very white working class area. And again, it was quite, you know, interesting because there would be things like, you know, people would come along and they'd be like, oh, you know, never had Nigerian food before, even though there's a big Nigerian community, African community in that part of the town. Um, and they'll see plantain and they'll be like, oh my God, I thought that was a banana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it was a good experience. So this year I started doing more residencies because I'm now decided that I want to start my own permanent, not a full blown restaurant maybe just like a takeaway place where you can also have sitting areas where you can come and you can get Nigerian food. But I also want it to be something where it's not just about food, you know, bringing the elements of cultural immersions. So maybe being, um, one of the visions that I had based on my doing residencies is I would like to open a space where other African chefs can come and eat and share their food. So I went to Senegal in 2015 and discovered Senegalese cuisine for the first time and absolutely fell in love with it. And for me, I'm like, I live in London, but I can only probably name maybe four or five different other um, African cuisines that I've tried. Um, so I want to create a space where, you know, it'll be like a taste of Africa. So every month, every six weeks, you know, you get a new chef that comes in and does their own residency and introduce their food to an, a new audience so it wouldn't just be Tokumba's kitchen it would be a kitchen for anyone and everyone involved in African cooking because I think you know African chefs have you know we are there's so many great foods on the continent that we've just not shared with the world so my vision is to create a space where that can happen and that's one of the things that you talk about so wonderfully on um, the clips that I saw of you on BBC, the, how important it is for you to sort of spread the flavor, if you will, of Nigerian cuisine and West African cuisine overall to the yeah. rest of the world. Because so, so many people aren't exposed to it or they eat it and don't even know what it is. Exactly. I mean, today, just this evening. So um, the place where I am, as I mentioned, I was there last summer and I remember when there was one guest who would almost every single day order Akara 
from the menu mm-hmm. and she absolutely loved it and i remember towards the end of my residency going to her and speaking to her and showing her the ingredients i'm like oh you can buy this you know you can buy the bean flour at home and cook it for yourself and the first day i went back i was meant to open the kitchen at 12 at 11 30 um the front staff came and they were like oh somebody's placed an um, order for akara they know you're not open to 12 but they just really wanted to place their order i was like oh okay be a good person. So I came out because I sometimes like to come out and do the front of house service myself. Mm-hmm. So I came out and it was the same lady. And she was like, girl, I have missed Akara. I'm not <laughs> and, you know, and I was speaking to her tonight. And again, her partner, they co- he comes in and he ordered something else on my menu. And he was like, I have missed your coconut prawns. And, you know, I love the fact that people like that who would not have gotten that opportunity to try Nigerian West African cuisine before, but fell in love with it and now been given an opportunity time and time and again. And for me, it's about, and this is why the food that I make, some Nigerians complain, they're like, oh, it's not spicy enough or you're doing it this way. And for me, I'm like, but if I cook Nigerian food the traditional way, nobody in London will be able to eat it except Nigerians. Mm-hmm. And that defeats the whole purpose of Tokumba's Kitchen. Tokumba's Kitchen is about introducing and bringing a taste of Nigeria to a wider global audience. So, for example, I was invited to um, attend um, an event in New York last October, um, the New York African Restaurant Week. And it was a series of events um, with different chefs and different restaurants, all about, again, spreading the greatness that is African, West African cuisine. And some of the people that attended my pop-ups Send, still send me messages asking for my recipes because they loved it. And again, for me, if I didn't have that opportunity, they would never have tasted jollof rice. They would never have tasted Akara. So I'm definitely about doing international global events and, you know, letting, I want, I want everybody to be as familiar with jollof rice, Akara, Suya, as they are with pizza, paella or chow mein. Mm-hmm. Now, what would you say would be your advice for anyone, again, who's starting, just starting out in their own restaurant business, whatever that looks like, or food business, I should say, even if it's not a restaurant, what would you say has been the key for you in helping to spread the word about your business and get media coverage from these great outlets? Um, Definitely social media. Um, Before I started my food business, I was a Twitter addict. Mm -hmm. Um, And you You first connected on Twitter, right? I was connected on Twitter. Um, my Twitter addiction has gone through different stages where I've sometimes had to take myself off Twitter. And then I'm like, actually, no, I'm just going to download the app again. Um, but it's also been a great platform because it's allowed me to share my story. So even before I became Tokumba's Kitchen, I would always be tweeting about cooking and sharing pictures of the food I was making on Instagram. And, you know, I used to have an hashtag where I called myself Chef Talks. So people already associated food with me. So when I then transitioned to starting a food business, it made sense. You know, I remember one time somebody saying to me, I remember the first time you made meat pie and you send the, you showed us the picture and we were like, oh my God, look how nasty that looks. And now look at you, look how well you are doing. And also when I'm going through a difficult time. So for example, there was a period last year when I was really tired, you know, the business wasn't going very well. And I remember just coming on and tweeting, I'm so tired. I don't think I can go on with this anymore. And I switched off my phone and Elaine, I woke up the next morning and I had all these messages from different people, even people that I didn't really connect with telling me, no, we've been seeing what you're doing. You are doing so well. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, And we all need that sometimes. I mean, oh, that changed my life. That really kind of, you know, gave me the kind of support that I needed to say, okay, well, if all these people from different parts of the world are watching me and seeing what I'm doing, then I need to keep doing this. So definitely being authentic in who you are and, you know, sharing your story. So I, there was a time when at the beginning of last year, I had a series of events that went spectacularly wrong. I tweeted about it. So I did a thread of the journeys of what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I shared that story and that encouraged other people because it's like they see what I'm doing and they see the high point. So when I was going to New York, you know, I started talking about it. Oh, so one of the other visions that I have, I don't know, you probably know John Boyega, who's in Star Wars. Yes. He's a British Nigerian like me mm-hmm. who loves pounded yam. 
the same way that I love panda jam. Panda jam is my favorite Nigerian food. This boy is always tweeting and talking about Nigerian food. And one of the things that I would love to do, and it's going to happen in 2018. I've been tweeting about it for a very long time. I want John Boyega to come and eat at my table. I want to feed this boy. Because there you go. Put it out there. I put it out there. I've, you know, I've been putting it out there for a long time, and I'm definitely sure 2018 is the year that is going to happen. So for me, so for example, when I was talking about the news, when I got the news about New York, so I like started teasing people. I was like, "Oh, I've got exciting news to share with you." I don't know what, but I can't tell you yet. And people are like, "Oh, is it John Boyga? Is it coming to eat at your table?" <laughs> right, <laughs> because they know you have been talking about it. That's true. That's exactly. so funny. And I just was who I was looking at someone on Twitter because I actually took social media off my phone, too, because it I, it was sucking so much of my time. But I still look at it on the computer. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad look, me. Yeah, I was looking back. I can't remember. Oh, Issa Rae. Issa Rae. I, I was posting a, a link to her. Someone mentioned her in an episode. So of course, I posted a link to her Twitter and then I started scrolling. I'm like, why am I going this far down in this girl's timeline? But it was so <laughs> funny to see her talk about, which wasn't too long ago, the beginnings of Insecure before they even and had a name for it I think she was talking about it and these are the people who were cast and all these are and then now to know that they've been nominated for a Golden Globe and you know all the things that we know now but just to your point sharing the journey the high points the low points the unsure points and all those things that you feel comfortable sharing it really gets people um, invested in your story exactly and so for me the other thing that has been really great is investing in PR So when I decided I wanted to launch the Supper Club, um, again, on Twitter, true Twitter, I had connected with this amazing um, PR lady who does amazing work advocating for um, more visibility for black entrepreneurs, especially black female entrepreneurs. Um, And she's also black and British Nigerian like me. What's her name? Ronke Lawa. Okay, you have to send me the spelling and I'll... I will. Um, and so, and I remember the first event that I did, that first um, festival, I remember her coming down and that was the first time we'd met, even though we'd been following each other on Twitter for years. That was the first time I met. And I remember straight away because the BBC were actually filming that event. And I remember she was trying to direct them to my store, but because I was just starting out, my store looked a mess and, you know, everything was out of place. So they weren't really interested in me at that time. But again, she was like, you know, giving me pointers and helping me to kind of kind of define what the business could be at that early stage. So when I then decided I wanted to do my supper clubs and I knew I wanted to invest, I wanted to make noise about it. I wanted people to know to Combo's Kitchen. So I contacted her because for me, I couldn't think of anybody else. It just made sense to work with Ronke. So I contacted her and I was like, you know, I'm trying to do this supper club. Um, And she was like, okay, and I want to do a press release because she had a um, small business package, which was the only thing I could afford at the time. Um, So I contacted her and I said, yeah, I want to do this. And she sent me some questions and asked me to put together some information. And I remember it was just before I went on holiday to Senegal. And I remember her saying to me, I'm going to leave you alone for the next two weeks. I'm not going to contact you, but straight away when you come back, there's going to be homework for you to do. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And by the time I came by, she had managed to get me three um, TV interviews, radio interviews, press interviews that till today are still benefiting my business. Mm. So that Um, was a wise investment. That was a wise investment. And even again, the reason I, the way I landed the BBC interview was because for my second year anniversary, because the thing with PR is it's a continuous thing. So you don't do it at like one time and then stop. Right. You have to carry on doing it. And even though I wasn't at the position where I was able to afford to pay her a monthly retainer, every time I would add something new happening, I would contact her and I'd be like, oh, could you do a press release for me on this new thing that I'm working on? So when I was doing my, when it was the second year anniversary of the business, I decided I wanted to do another supper club celebrating two years of being, of running the kitchen. Um, and again, and we use the tagline of, you know, Tokumbo wants to feed the world, but for now, well, Tokumbo wants to feed John Boyega, but for now she's happy to feed the world because that was also the time when mm-hmm. I was about to go to New York. Mm-hmm. So she came up with this amazing press release. And so that then landed me a speaking engagement at a food trends event here in London. And what that event is, is they studied the food trends, which they think are going to be what people are going to be into in the coming year. And they felt that West African cuisine. And actually the guy, because when we met with the um, organizer, he said to me that they've been studying and watching West African chefs and cuisine 
for quite a while, but they didn't feel like they'd add somebody who could give it a voice. So when he got my press release and he saw my backstory, he was like, yeah, this, you know, she seems to be the person that could talk about that. So I was asked to speak at that in-game event, um, which was an amazing experience for me. And, you know, it was like 300 people from the industry. Um, and after that interview, before my talk, I remember the journalist coming up to me and she was like, oh, she works for a BBC um, service. And they've got a big following in Nigeria. And she wanted to interview me for their radio um, station. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. Sure, why not? And during that interview, she then asked me, is there a kitchen where you work in and you can we can come and film you? So I said, well, I've just moved to a new place. So you can come film me there. Or I'm also going to be doing a Christmas event, um, pop and supper club event at the beginning of December. And that was it. So investing in that PR, in that press release, for my anniversary led me to become me being invited to um, talk at that event, which then led BBC to want to interview me and come along and film me, which again, as ad, is having, you know, more, it's, it's a great investment. So definitely investing in PR and investing in not just that one time, but as much as possible, if you can afford it every month, if not every time that you've got some news or something different is happening in your business that you want to share with the world and, gain more momentum, I would definitely advise somebody to think about that. Excellent. Excellent advice. So in closing to Kumbo, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Um, without a shadow of a doubt, it would be my mom. Um, my mom is, she was my first role model. Um, for me, you know, she wasn't a typical Nigerian mom in a lot of ways because she was quite liberal. It was interesting enough, it was only years later when I got older that my mom started to show traits of being an African mom. And I'm looking at her like, really, woman? Really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm grown now. I'm already been doing what I'm going to do. But um, I remember, you know, from when I was making decisions about what courses I wanted to do in uni, you know, she gave me freedom. She didn't do the African thing of, oh, you have to be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant. She let me make my own choices. And even though during, you know, being a teenager in London and growing up with an African mom was challenging because she would always say things like, oh, if you lived in Nigeria, you wouldn't be doing this. And I'd have to say, well, we don't live in Nigeria, so I am going to do what I want to do. Um, you know, we had a great relationship and I, you know, she's always supporting me, even when she's not understood what I want, wanted to do. So when I was going to DC, for example, um, because I knew it was a one year program and I'd already moved my daughter to Nigeria with me, then came back to London and I didn't want to move her again. Um, so I left my daughter with my mom for a year. And, you know, I remember, you know, even my sister, she was like, oh, she would not be able to do that. But for her, her experience of, of um, being separated from my mom for a long time has affected the way she thinks about parenting. But for me, I was like, who best, who's the best person to look after my daughter, if not my mom? So, you know, she's always kind of supported my choice, even when she didn't fully understand or agree or saw why I was doing what I was doing. Um, but since I started this food business, you know, she, because she's a businesswoman herself, she's completely 100% in line. And also she gets to eat free food. Right. So who so, doesn't love that? You know, she and the kitchen where I'm working right now is quite close to where she lives. So whenever I've done something, I'll call her and be like, mom. So yesterday, for example, she came down to the kitchen to pick up some food. And, you know, she, you know, she supports me financially, emotionally, um, physically. So I am so grateful for her. If I would not be who I am, if not for the strength that I have seen her exhibit in terms of, you know, becoming a widow of four children at the age of 33 and, you know, leaving Nigeria and coming to England and, you know, taking on menial jobs, cleaning jobs and whatever it took to look after her kids. Um, yeah, she's inspirational. So, and my mom actually went back to get her HND, CM, HND in business management two years ago. Two years ago. Oh, yeah, yes, mom. I love I it. The age, so that was very inspiring for me and for my daughter to see. So awesome! So now tell us the ways that we can support you. I'm sure everyone wants to know where they can find Tacumbo's Kitchen, find out more about you. Of course, I'll have links to everything, but tell everyone your website and social media, all that good stuff. So my um, 
website is Tokumbas Kitchen. So T O K U N B O S K I T C H E N dot com. And all my social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, are at Tokumbas Kitchen, one word. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter. I am very, I also have my own personal Twitter, which I tend to tweet on more than my business Twitter. And that is Toxic K, so T O K S Y K 27. And, you know, you can please reach out to me, contact me. I am such an open book. Like I said, I spend more of my life on Twitter sometimes <laughs> than I should be. Right. Um, That's why I had to take it off my phone, girls. Like, I, I have to get off social right. media. Yeah, you know, yeah, because I feel like I have to respond to people right away. Of course, I want to respond to people, but you don't have to do it in the moment. That's what I had to tell myself. So I said I had to remove it. I just, I just, I got to the point where I said to myself, Tokumba, do you really need to tweet that? No. Put the phone down. <laughs> <laughs> like, you really don't need to tweet that right, right. now. This it's not, it's not, it's not news that anybody needs to know except you. So just let it go. Let it go. Um, One of the I things you tweeted that. about recently, though, which I appreciate, I saw you talked about, did, wasn't that you who talked about Trey oh Anthony's episode? God. Elaine, what? that woman changed my life. What? No, seriously, I don't believe in coincidences. So this is the, I'm going to Jamaica, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't planning on going to Jamaica before, but I am now going to Jamaica in April. Do you know what happened to me? So on last week's Sunday, I went to, no, Saturday, I went to a meetup group and there was this amazing Jamaican lady who'd grown up in America and, you know, she was basically my soulmate. We connected, we spent like four hours just talking. We've been talking since then. And then, um, so I tweeted about that. And my other Jamaican friend in DC man, tweeted back to me to say, oh, she can come along to um, our future groups. And I was like, see, this is why I love you. Mm -hmm. And then I, on Tuesday, I started listening. To, so I try to listen to your podcast almost every day when I'm commuting, going to work. Bless you. And I was listening to Trey's in, um, interview and straight away, I started thinking about this lady that I just met. So I sent her the interview and I was like, oh my God, this interview is resonating so much with me, but I know it's probably going to mean so much more for you. And she did. And she's like, listening to me. She's like, girl, I had to pause this interview because I was crying because she was basically oh. telling my story. I finished listening to that interview and I started listening to it again. Mm. I listened to that interview three times. Like everything she was saying was resonating with me, especially in terms of, like I said, you know, one of my goals is to write my book. And because, you know, I feel like I've had so many different experiences and so many things have happened to me over my life. Even in the last 10 years, I have reinvented my life so many times, um, sometimes by choice, sometimes by circumstance. And when I tell people my story, they're always like, you need to write a book. And I've been like, yeah, I'm going to write a book, but then I've not really done anything to get writing so now I'm like and then I'm listening to her story and I was just like oh this woman's amazing and then so the same day I was listening to her I um, met another lady from Jamaica who's in London because she's come to, to have her graduation she was a scholar that was studying in um, UK last year and we connected and she was telling me about her group of friends who have come together and they've just, so she, because she got her own scholarship and she attended the women of the world event in London in 2016, when she went home, she wanted to give back. So she decided to put together her group of friends and they've used using kindness and collaboration, her words to help empower a young girl. So they, um, found a girl who was achieving, you know, I achieve her, but from a um, under and disadvantaged community in Jamaica, and they put together money to give this young girl a scholarship. I was like, that's a movement I want to get involved with. And then she was telling me that her friend has a cooking show in Jamaica, and you know, they go around interviewing chefs and they come together. And she was like, you need to come and cook Nigerian food for us. And I was like, well, I was planning on going to Cuba anyway, so guess what? I'm coming to Jamaica. So wow. Jamaica is all around you. It was meant to Jamaica be. Is all around me. I mean, my first boyfriend was Jamaican as well. So. No. Let me just <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's awesome. Well, again, I appreciate, I appreciate you being here today. I definitely appreciate you listening to the podcast for so long. That means a lot to me. Like you said, we all need to hear once in a while that our work matters and it's impacting people and people are listening. So I appreciate that. Every tweet, even though I don't want you to have your phone in your hand all the time. Every oh, I, tweet, every uh, comment, being yes. a part of the mastermind group. I love having you in there. So I'm, I'm happy we we're able to connect voice to voice. 
Thank you, Elaine. I mean, for what you're doing, everything that you're doing, supporting women and, you know, letting women know that they need support and support is sexy. And I want to help you spread that message. I want to help you in whatever way that I can. I want support is sexy to be a movement, mm-hmm. not just for you, you know, something that we can all get involved with, whichever way that we're doing it. Um, you know, some of the things that I'm doing, that some of the collaborations that I'm now working on are based on that message that you're spreading, that support is sexy. And so thank you, really, please. You know, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you so much. We'll have to talk and come up with some ways to, I I told you, I still, I want you to cook for me. That's purely selfish when I come to London, but we're going to come up with some ideas. Yeah, I'm ready. Like, honestly, I, I mean, I love the fact that you're about to go live your own dreams and, you know, that thing about traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait to hear (laughs) about the stories because for me, that's, you know, you are going to be giving other women exposure and opportunities that they probably would never have had. And you're going to be sharing their stories and stories are powerful. Um, So for me, you are doing exactly what you're living your purpose. And that is so great to be a part of. Oh, Takumbo, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Now, before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? Oh, trust yourself. Um, you are your biggest critic, but you also have the insight. Um, when I initially started thinking about starting the business and I was thinking about pricing, um, I remember contacting, you know, doing a little survey amongst my friends and I was like, okay, how much do you think I should sell my meat pie for? And they'll be like, oh, this is how much it's been sold. So maybe you should sell it at this price. And even though in my head I had a different price, um, Elaine, the very first event that I did one of the customers actually came to my stall and she was like, do you know what? I've gone to every other stall around here and you are on the selling yourself. Please. Mm-hmm. The pricing. So that was a very important lesson for me to learn very early on in the business. And every time I've, you know, not completely listened to my inner voice and followed my instinct about a situation or a person or something I'm about to take, it usually doesn't go well. So I've learned to, whenever I am in doubt, I meditate, I think about it and yeah, I might ask for advice, I might ask questions, but ultimately I trust what I know is best for me. Excellent. Takumbo, thank you so much. Hold on just a second. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Takumbo. To find out more about her and about Takumbo's Kitchen, I want you to go to supportissexypodcast.com. Go to the search icon at the top and just search Takumbo. T-O-K-U-N-B-O. Her show notes page will pop up with all of the links, all of the great resources that she mentioned in this episode, the ways to find out more about her and about Tacumbo's Kitchen and how to follow her and chat with her on Twitter. She's very active on Twitter and it's quite fun. Go to supportissexypodcast.com. Again, just search Tacumbo. Thank you all so much for listening. You know, I appreciate you being here. If you're not already, please subscribe to the podcast. I say that every time just in case you heard it before and you forgot or in case this is your first time joining us. If you love this conversation with Takumbo, we have plenty more in the past episodes and plenty more coming. So make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss a thing. Just hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening. You'll be all set. And if you love this episode, I'd love to hear a review from you. Tell me what you think of the episode or what you think of the podcast overall. I always say I love a five-star review, but any feedback is so appreciated. All right. So thank you again so much for being here. I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Actually, it depends on when you're listening to this. So it might be tomorrow. For me, it'll be tomorrow. For you, it'll be whenever you tune in again. But you're going to subscribe so you won't miss anything, right? All right. Until we chat again. Always remember, you deserve support, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.